So, and, and with obrigado, my Portuguese unluckily ends. So, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm Italian, so if you speak slowly in Portuguese to me, I may be able to understand you, but beyond this, I, I'm really sorry, I apologize, I will have to try to speak in English. So, um, as, as you may have realized from the introduction by Rodrigo, I am not Charlie, and it's not difficult to see that I'm not Charlie. Um, <coughs> so, I am going to speak about a um, topic which is quite different from uh, what has been uh, discussed in this conference until now. <clears throat> I'm uh, going to talk about a way to automatically track and characterize botnets, making use of data uh, extracted from a passive DNS listener. So, um, I should say that this work uh, has been done in cooperation with three other authors, Federico, Lorenzo, and Stefano. Uh, and in particular, I should acknowledge that um, Stefano, who is now working for Google, has been possibly the major contributor of this work. So whatever good is there, it's Stefano's, the other Stefano's merit, and whatever bad is there, it's possibly my fault. So um, I will start with an introduction uh, I will sweep through it, but since I, don't, I didn't know uh, the precise level uh, of knowledge that you had of the phenomenon, I wanted to, in any case, go through some basic definitions. So if you are experts in botnet or malware analysis, keep, I, you know, just shut down your brain for like five minutes while I bring up to speed the other people that may not be uh, just uh, as keen on that topic. So, as you, I think, all know, a botnet is basically a set, a network of malware-infected devices. They may be computers, they may be uh, smartphones, they may be tablets, they may be cars uh, that have been infected with malware and that connect to a command and control infrastructure to be controlled and governed by someone we will call a botmaster. Um, what they are used for, you know, they are used for information harvesting from the specific devices they have infected, or they are used in order to abuse those devices to do bad things. What types of bad things? That depends on the intents of the botmaster. So, um, botnets are very widespread. They have, uh, so there's, uh, for instance, uh, botnets that have been measured to count in the millions of machines. And they are, major, uh, they are a major threat to the stability of the internet infrastructure. Because anybody who controls such a sizable portion of internet machines can unleash epically destructive attacks on whatever target they choose. Um, so we have seen that the definition, the very definition of a botnet uh, relies on the presence of a command infrastructure, of a way for the botmaster to control all these compromised machines. And this channel needs to be bidirectional, uh, so basically the machines need to be able to get in touch with the command and control channel to report what they got and also to receive updates. Actually, um, if, you look at, uh, um, if you look at one of my earlier works, the one that I presented last year, um, here at H2HC, um, th there are a lot of self-update mechanisms in malware that generate uh, a number of updates per week or even per day. So bots are actually much more updated than the basic operating systems that we run on our machines. Um, this makes the, mass, the um, command and control server the single point of failure of the whole botnet. If the botnet cannot control the, the botmaster through the command and control, the botnet is effectively useless. So, defenders try to disable command and control channels in order to take down botnets. Sometimes, we are even able to take control of botnets, and so to shut them down permanently. But if you are able to make the botmaster unable to use his or her command and control system, you have effectively 
by all means disabled the, 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 the botnet. Um, so, since botmasters know this, they have applied their efforts to try to secure their command and control infrastructure so that it's sync calling proof, so that it cannot be sync called, turned into something unreachable. Um, basically, if you think about it, there's no way for the bot master to make it impossible for us to detect where the command and control infrastructure is and to take it down. But they can make it very costly and very difficult. And boy, they are very good at doing that. So um, the idea is that they can do either of two things. One thing is switching over to peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure. Instead of having one single command and control center, they can use a peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure in the botnet, making commands diffuse through the bot network. This is actually rarely done, even if it's very effective, because those protocols are much more difficult to build in a very reliable way. Um, so most, most boat masters have gone into uh, a hunt for the perfect command and control mechanism that uses a client-server architecture. And uh, this introduces the concept of different rallying mechanisms, so different mechanisms for the botnet to reach the command and control infrastructure. Um, the first and most basic rallying mechanism is I insert, I hard code an IP address into the bot. I diffuse the bot, the bot contacts this IP address. This is, of course, a very weak rallying mechanism because it only takes to the defenders to be able to sync call to new route that IP address to make that IP address disappear or even to place our own command and control infrastructure at that address to take down the botnet. So as you may guess, our coded IPs are rarely used. There can be lists of addresses. There can be lists of addresses that are sent to the bots every time the bot is updated. So there's ways to make this slightly more robust than one single hard-coded IP address. But in general, this is a, a very naive, a very lame mechanism. Um, the, uh, the main issue that the um, hard-coded IP technique brings up is that if you're a malware author and you write credentials or IP addresses or whatever else are coded in your malware, I, as an analyst, I just need to take it apart, look at the code, and see where it connects to. Or even more easily, I can just run into a, into a sandbox and see what IP address or domain name they try to connect to. So it's very easy to thwart this, this type of, uh, this type of uh, of connection. The same happens actually if there is an encoded domain in the box. The only difference is that instead of sync calling the IP address, in this case, we need to take over the registration of the domain name. But this can be done. So there, there are task forces of people that work on taking down domain names that have been registered for malicious purposes. It is not immediate but it can be done. So if your bot keeps connecting to evil.org, at some point, some of us will be able to take over the registration of evil.org to convince the registrar to give it over and to make that botnet disappear. Um, there's actually a paper by Jung and others. You will find it listed in the references after my slides um, that shows that in any case, going from an R-coded IP to an R-coded domain name makes the, uh, the effort of taking it down harder. It's much easier for defenders to get to null route a malicious server than to take over the registration of a domain name, for, for obvious reasons. It's not easy to take over the registration of a domain name. It's, it's pretty much built to make it not so easy, even if we know that there are counter examples to that. Um, 
So basically, the whole idea of having something are coded into the bots does not really work very well. So what the um, bot owners came up with was a scheme that is called domain, gen domain generation algorithms. A domain generation algorithm is basically this. Um, every day, your malware generates a list of random strings, random domain names, based on some unpredictable seed, which could be, for instance, the trending topic of Twitter for a given country at a given time of the day. You cannot predict it. It's an input for the algorithm, so it's a random seed. And this random seed allows the generation of, say, 50,000 random domains. I, as the bot master, at that time in the morning, just need to sip my coffee, look at the top trending topic, fit that into my domain generation algorithm that I wrote, generate my 50,000 domains, pick a random one, and register it. During the day, my bots will generate all 50,000 of those, look at all 50,000 of those, and wherever they find one that responds, that's their command and control for that day. Now, if you think about it, this is basically uh, a very good strategy for the attacker. They have 50,000 domains to choose from. If I take away one of those, they can either wait for the next day, where another list will be generated, or they can just register one of the other 50,000. The machines will automatically cycle to try that at least and reach the new command and control, even that same day. So if I want to be prevented, I should, one, reverse engineer the algorithm, two, wait every day for the random seed to appear, the trending topics at that time of the day, take that trending topics, run them through the algorithm that I reversed, and be faster than the bot master in registering or taking down all those 50,000 domains, which in any case costs a lot of money and takes a lot of time. So basically, this scheme makes it very hard for the defenders to actually block the domain, na the domain name uh, registration and then the connection of the bots. Not only that, but... Uh, Basically, since the malware code only contains the algorithm for generation and not the seed, the malware code is what we would call agnostic. If you reverse engineer it, you get a part of the solution, but not all of the solution. And this generates data symmetry that we're saying. The bot master has a much, less, uh, has much lower cost than we have as defenders. Um, moreover, since every day the machines will go through this list and, and actually look for their new uh, command and control, if the bot master wants to migrate to move his infrastructure from one provider to another, from one bulletproof hosting to another, they will be able to do that without needing any updates or anything. They just need to sh use that IP address when they next register their new domain. Um, the problem is that we don't really have a proactive way to defend against these schemes. Uh, the only thing that we can do is to try to make use of these schemes to identify new botnets that are beginning to use a new DGA scheme. Because that's the only way this scheme actually helps us instead of helping the malware authors. All of these botnets behave in a very characteristic way that we can employ to detect them. Um, and what's the natural observation point? Well, think about it. These are clients that are generating 50,000 queries every day looking for non-existent domains. So the DNS infrastructure is actually a very good observation point to see what's happening. <coughs> so. Um, there are some systems already that are working on telling you if a domain is benign or malicious. 
The most famous one is Exposure, that has been built by my lovely colleague, Leila Bilge, uh, formerly at Eurocom and now at Semantic Research. And you can find it. You go to exposure.iceclub.org and you will see a list of malicious domains uh, that have been automatically found out by correlating data. There's a paper by Leila cited in, in, the, uh, in the references, and I really recommend that you read it. If you find my talk interesting, that paper will be even more interesting to you, because it's a very, it's a very beautiful paper. Um, also, uh, Antona Kakis and others have been working on this same issue, and their observation is very, very, is very, very naive, but very, very powerful at the same time. They say, okay, so basically we have these machines that are infected with AGD malware. What do they do? They generate a lot of queries to DNS for non-existent domains. So if you are using a machine and you're browsing the internet, nowadays, most of the time, most of the users will just type stuff into Google or any other search engine of their liking. To, to browse, right? People, I mean, my mother, for instance, she even types the web address. If you give her like www.polymy.it, she will type that in Google searching for it. So most people do not type addresses directly. It's, it's very rare, not terribly rare, but very rare that you actually resolve a domain and you get a, an NX domain response, a response that says that the domain does not exist. So, if you say a machine that in a few minutes generates 25,000 NX domains queries, or even over a day, you are pretty much sure that that machine is infected with a malware that is automatically generating domains. There's no way on earth that someone will, will type 25,000 wrong addresses in a, in a single day. Either they are a compulsive mistyper, or they will not do that, right? So, um, basically, uh, this, this intuition is very good for detecting machines that are infected by an AGD malware, even if you don't know that malware. Even if it's a new malware, you can tell that by the behavior of the machine. But they have, uh, and uh, also um, this, this solution and also Leila's exposure solution, they have a couple of drawbacks. Let's say limitations, things that they are not designed to do. The first limitation is that they do not correlate. So if you see 10,000 machines that behave weirdly, you can pinpoint all 10,000 of them, but you cannot tell which is infected by which until you take apart the machine, you look at the binary that is actually generating those queries, and you then analyze the binaries. But they are not looking at the relationships between these domains that are being contacted. And so they cannot tell if it's four threads, it is five botnets, if it's 20 that are generating this traffic. The second thing is that uh, basically, if you pick up exposure, for instance, which is, I, I repeat, beautiful research, one of the best ever done in this area, uh, it actually tells you that the, domain, that the domain is malicious, but it doesn't really tell you what type of malicious activities it is being used for. Uh, there used to be an infrastructure called FIRE that would uh, actually tell you this for IP addresses, but for domain names, there's no such thing. Um, so the, um, the, the, uh, this is the Summary of what we said about the NX domain thing, I anticipated myself, right? The detection by the number of uh, NX domains. And as I said, it's a very naive but very powerful way to detect the single machines that are infected. However, there's a very, very big constraint for these type of systems. Since you need to see the NX domain responses, you actually need to control the caching DNS of that machine. You don't see that at the point of observation of a passive DNS sensor, for instance. In a passive DNS sensor, NX domains, even if you are collecting at a some point of the, of, of the hierarchy, 
NX domain responses, you will not see the amount of requests made by clients on that domain. And you will not see which client made that, uh, that query. The reason why most researchers such as us can have easy, not free, but easy access to passive DNS data is that it does not disclose personal information. I do not see the IP address of the station that made that request. And so the uh, data aggregator feels comfortable in, in giving me access to that data. That data does not give me personal information. Um, and from the scientific point of view, this also means that, for instance, if I wanted to repeat the experiments of Anton Akakis, I couldn't. Because, of course, they used data that I had privileged access to. I wouldn't have access to that data. Whereas, if you use passive DNS data, there's a lot of researchers that can replicate your experiment because we have all access to that data. Um, so our objective was to build a system. We, co we codenamed it Phoenix. We found out that it was a very bad code name because there's a gazillion things even related to DNS that are called Phoenix already. So I'm not sure that the name will stay this one. Um, which identifies active domain generation algorithms. Uh, it correlates the activities of these algorithms by telling us which botnet is generating what. And basically it can tell us about new botnets that we did not know about in the first place. All of this by using only passive DNS data, so not requiring privacy sensitive access to data. And so this means that it can also be deployed easily to do global tracking. Because basically we can just have access to two, three different passive DNS sensors and get all the data we need without uh, excessive uh, privacy problems. Um, there's a number of challenges in doing this. Of course, it is difficult to actually build the infrastructure to keep up because we are not Google, right? So we are a university in, a, uh, in Italy, so under, chronically underfunded, I'm pretty sure that Brazil and Italy are, are share many properties in that, in that space. Um, so we don't have an enormous infrastructure. We needed to make this very easy and very lightweight. Um, the second challenge, the real challenge, is whenever you are building a black box tool to get new information, new intelligence, you have no ground truth. What you are building the, truth, the tool for is to get new intelligence. There's no ground truth. If you had the ground truth, you would not build the tool. So you need to figure out also ways to test if the tool works. And I, I will show you, I will try to show you that the tool actually works. So Phoenix works in two phases. Uh, basically, there is a bootstrap phase where we initialize the system, and then the system goes on and automatically adapts itself to the evolution of the situation. Uh, the first phase, we call it DGA discovery. Uh, and the second phase is basically the detection of automatically generated domains. Um, let's see the two phases. So let's start with the core observation that basically is the basis of the system. Once you have understood this, the rest of the system is just the engineering to make it work. AGDs, automatically generated domains, are always very random looking strings, high entropy strings. Why is that? Because I, as the bot master, want to generate domains that are possibly, that are possibly free. So this is a set of you know, examples. Um, there's a shortened one, because otherwise I wouldn't stay on the slide, which was a, a basically an, an, an md 5 ashcocc but the rest is automatically generated domain. Um, if you look at them, the key intuition behind Phoenix is that these are not domains that a human would register, right? When you register a domain, you do so because you don't want to spell out, okay, connect to 131.175.120.1, which is the name server of Polymy. Uh, you want to give them a name that they will remember. So gkeqr.org is not a very good domain name. 
by all means. And this is because basically these names uh, violate all of the rules of commonly created names in, let's say, English and Latin languages. So we, recognize, we can recognize them by making use of what we call uh, linguistic-based features. Linguistic-based features means, for instance, just to give you an example of a feature, um, if you pick up an, uh, 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 an, uh, a domain name and you look at how much of the components of that domain name are actual words from a dictionary, if you pick up a common domain name, facebook.com, well, face is a word, book is a word, the, cardi the whole cardinality of, the, of Facebook is, is inside words, right? So it's one, the ratio of the dimensions. Well, if you pick up the other, pub is actually a word, but str is not a word outside of computer science. So that's a much less likely humanly generated domain. HGD stands for humanly generated domain, AGD for automatically generated domain. Of course, this is not enough, I mean, because otherwise you, will, you, you would fail this on, on, on some examples. Um, there's another feature that is very powerful that is commonly used to filter out randomly generated strings from humanly generated strings, which is the uh, popularity of the n-grams. An n-gram, one, one gram would be the, the, the definition of uh, how, how likely a letter is in a given language. A two-gram is the combination of two letters. So how common is the sequence of those two letters in a language? Three gram, the same with three letters, and so on and so forth. So basically, if you pick up the English dictionary and you compute the popularity of the digrams that compose a word, and we pick two examples, you, our usual friend facebook.com and this automatically generated domain name. I, if anybody wants to try to spell it out, you're very welcome. You will see that this, there are uh, digram combinations in this word that will never appear in the English language. RQ will never appear in the most common words in the English language. QV is completely legal in English language. There's no word that can sound QV in English. I don't, I don't think it is in Brazilian and for sure not in Italian. So, well, even AW in Italian is, is going to be a very difficult word, a combination to find. But this means that if you look at a humanly generated and an automatically generated domain, they will have drastically different likelihood scores based on this. Um, so what we do is basically we use the um, ratio of words found in dictionaries, the one gram, two gram, and three gram likelihood as features for describing each domain name. So we can represent each domain name with, with these four features. And what we did was we picked up the 100,000 top domains for Alexa, which we thought was a very good example of humanly generated domains. And what we see is, okay, now everything that is far from this reference is possibly automatically generated. Now, actually, it turns out that if you use uh, um, the uh, so-called Mahalanobis distance, which is a typical distance that we use in automatic learning, it's just similar to the Euclidean distance, but basically it weighs the components of the distance by the variability, hmm, by the variance of the attribute. So if an attribute is more variable, that component will get weighed differently than an attribute that is less variable. Because in this way, you can actually work with variables that in some directions uh, are, very, uh, are, are very different, and in some directions they are very compact. Otherwise, with the Euclidean distance, in many learning problems, you run into issues because one of the directions that you have studying is very compact, 
and it's basically pushing together all of the things that you are using. Um, there's a couple of parameters here that I will explain to you later on a graph, so let's ignore it for a moment. Here is the graph. Basically, if you plot, so we are plotting points that have four dimensions. So apologies, but I cannot really plot four dimensions. I could plot theoretically three, but what I resorted to do to show you the data is actually plotting two dimension using a technique that is called principal component analysis. Principal component analysis is a statistical technique that you use when you have a, an object that has many dimension and you want to show it with only two or three. What you are doing is basically you are calculating what is the best projection that you can make so that most of the characteristics of the data show. It's a bit more complicated than that, so if there's anybody with a background in statistics or mathematics, don't kill me. We can discuss the peculiarities of PCA later, but I didn't want to lose anybody in particular being standing between you and lunch, since Charlie so kindly left this spot to me <laughs> in, uh, you know, without actually letting me know before. Um, so, basically we have all these points that I plotted are representations of domains. The Alexa domains are the ones that you see in very light Cheyan over there. And actually, where you see that the red dot with Mu with it, that's the center of the cluster of the Alexa domains. So that's the center of the characteristic that usually define the most common humanly generated domains. Basically, if you plot uh, what should be a circle, but in reality is an Alice, because of course, the, uh, since we have compressed it with the principal component analysis, it got shifted. It's like you had a, a sphere in the space, but then you cut it through with a, with a plane. It's not going to be a sphere anymore, it's an ellipse. So, um, what you see over there, the other two bands, are domains that are slightly beyond the threshold of the Alexa domains. So they may be humanly generated and, and, and bad at that, or they may be automatically generated. We are not sure. And then there's that stripe, the blue stripe over there, that we can give with a very reasonable confidence that is automatically generated. No human is going to register that. Yeah, you can, I mean, false, false results are always possible because maybe you make a joke and you register kr09hkl.com because that has some meaning. It's the, I don't know, the sure h2hc.org, for instance. That, that, that has some meaning, but it doesn't really sound like humanly generated. And in fact, it was generated by Rodrigo, so it's not human. Okay. Um, so, it, it, errors will always happen. But the, the domains in that blue stripe are very different from what humans usually do. So, um, basically what we do is this. We pick up DNS traffic. We start from a flat list of domains that exposure or any other automatic system for detecting malicious domains tells us, okay, this is malicious. Why do we start from malicious? Because in this way, we reduce even more the possibility of false positives. We are looking for automatically generated looking domains inside a list of, a, of malicious things. So, we are filtering that, and we can actually be very strict. So, go and, and reduce ourselves to that blue stripe, so that we are very secure. We are taking the worst looking domains inside a list of known malicious domains. More sure than this, I don't know what to do. Um, of course, the list that we get contains both automatically generated things and malicious things that are not automatically generated. So we filter out those. Once we have filtered out those, we have a list of things that look automatically generated and for sure have been malicious. So the possibility that these are botnet command and control centers 
is terribly high. So what we do is we apply the same type of linguistic features plus some other features that I will show in a little while to do what I call AGD clustering. So because we have this pool of automatically generated domains and now we want to know which is which. Which of them has been generated by which botnet? How do we try to do that? So we build a graph. Each automatically generated domain is a node of the graph. We connect nodes of the graph if the two nodes at some point in past resolved to the same IP address. If at some point in past those two nodes resolved to the same IP address, it means that they very likely are correlated. The same person has, has run those two names and has used those two names on the same IP address. So what, we do, what happens is that uh, if we basically remark and we apply, we, we, we basically make it stronger, the link, if that IP address is very unique, because if that IP address is the IP address of some well-known bulletproof provider that uses always the same IP address, then, you know, the correlation is very weak. But if it's an IP address that has been used only in specific campaigns, and we know that because we can see how many times that IP address shows up in our database, we make that link stronger. The end result is that basically these domains end up in a social network of bots that you can partition. And partitioning leads you to discover the clicks of names that have been generated by the same botnet. Um, that was the simple example with colors, so the, boy, the toy example. This is the real graph. And those bulks of connection that you see, one I have, a couple I have drawn as, um, lines around, but you can see them. This is, a real, this is real data. Those bulks of things connected to each other strongly are a single botnet. And wherever you see links that go from one botnet to the other, it means that A, either they share the same creator or they are using the same bulletproof hoster and so they share some IP addresses. But the strong correlation is between um, domains of the same botnet. And this is all automatic. I don't need to say anything to, to the system. I just need to throw into it a list of malicious domains, human or automatic, doesn't matter, and automatically I can generate these clusters. So when I have generated these clusters, which look like that, so these are four real clusters got out of, you know, automatically collected data, you can already see, if you look at them, we as a human, you can already see that they have some characteristics, right? You, you could almost write a rule for matching those domains. And so what we did is basically we um, extracted and characterized fingerprints of those domains. The top level domain, some linguistic features, the length, the character set, because those are the typical features that define a specific algorithm, and the IP addresses correlated to that botnet. So what happens is that now, that, that we have these clusters already formed from the malicious domain list, we can look at all of the DNS traffic. Not just the malicious one, also the benign one. We can even use the loser threshold. Do you remember? There was a small ellipse in the middle, and then there were two stripes. For the first step, we used the outer stripe because we want it to be very sure. Now, we can use also the inner stripe, so get more stuff, because when we get this stuff and we get something that eh, may be humanly generated or may be uh, automatically generated or may be Rodrigo generated, which as we said is a third category from human and automatic, we can match those domains to those clusters, to those seeds that we already had and we can see if they match. If they match, they are automatically generated domains belonging to the same cluster. If they don't match, we can throw them away because they are possibly automatically generated. 
they are possibly humanly generated, they don't match with information that we already have. So for the moment, it's just like the form, if you are, uh, if you are passionate of chemistry, it's just like the formation of crystals. We created the seed of the crystals and we accrete stuff around those, those seeds. The rest of the solution of domains stays around. And so basically, uh, now what we can do is, given any previously unseen domain, we can answer these two questions. Does it look like it's automatically generated? Does it actually belong to one of the clusters we discovered? So, evaluation. How, how do I prove that this, this old good theory that I showed works? Well, as we said, it's very difficult because we are producing new stuff. So we don't have a background. So basically what we did was we built our own background data. So basically we picked up several known botnets of the past and their data and we run them through our system to see if we would have been able to automatically identify them at the time. We use the automatically generated name of Configure, for three different versions of Torpig, of Bamital. Actually, the graph that you saw before, the one with the big clusters connected, is the graph from this run. Um, well, how do, I, how do we see that our system is working? First of all, how do we see if we are able to separate well humanly generated and automatically generated domains? So this is a graph uh, with what is called the empirical cumulative distribution function. Don't run away. <laughs> Stop there. It's very easy. It means, in cumulative distribution function, it means that the graph goes from 0 to 1 and basically on the x-axis is the melanoma distance between that domain and the centroid that we saw. So basically what the graph is showing is that if you pick up the humanly generated domains, the black line over there, they are very close to the center. Their, their cumulative distribution shows that most of them, a very high portion of them, is very close to the, to the median. Then of course, there's a number of them that will be farther from the, from the center than automatically generated domains. And if you see it, you see also, you see two things. Well, one thing is that most human generated domains are closer to the center than automatically generated domains, which is good. The second thing that you see is that actually there are behaviors of the different families that are very different. So they will be located in different portions of the space. And this tells us that this characteristic can be used also for separating families. It's not enough, but it can be used as an additional feature to separate families. Um, we can validate the uh, recall of the filter, which means, so if I pick up a data set where there is um, a number of domains that belong to uh, bots, how many of them will be caught by the system at the end of the evaluation? Because remember, we just feed them into the system and we look at if the system recognizes them as being botnet generated. So, long story short, more than 90% in most cases of the automatically generated domains are recognized. How much time do I have? Okay. Um, basically, uh, what we saw was that, I, 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 did, I don't show the results here because they would be lengthy to show. They are tables of numbers and tables of graphs. It's, it's really difficult to show. But <coughs> uh, this is coming out uh, possibly as a, uh, as a scientific publication soon, and in any case, I will post as soon as I can the technical report and, and, and let it go with the slides on H2C, H2HC website, so you will be able to download it and, and look at the, the whole data if you want. 
what we can show is that the clustering uh, basically is able to isolate those families without us telling them anything. So if I run the algorithm on those data that they already know is part of families, I get those families. I get 90% plus of the domains that were automatically generated in those families. And I can also show that the um, sensitivity thresholds, those limits of the two stripes that we saw, <clears throat> are not dependent on the specific single malware, because if they were, the game is over. We have built an automatic system that is not actually automatic, because you need to tune it for each malware. But instead, they are very reliable. So you can set them and let the system run, and it will run well on all families, all families that we tested at least. Um, so this is the result of feeding Phoenix with a DNS traffic dump, random one. We, re we basically obtain a lot of previously unseen domains. We are able to associate them to clusters of domains, and if you look at them, humanly, you can see that they are actually the same domain, the same type of uh, domain generation algorithm. And we were able to validate this by uh, producing novel blacklists of automatically generated domains. We were able to discover uh, CNC servers. In, in some cases, we were able to help with takedowns of botnets by locating uh, how, uh, what a specific set of names uh, which, which cluster did a specific set of names happen to be in. So we were able to validate it qualitatively by providing intelligence to friends and seeing that this intelligence was actually good. Um, we can also use Phoenix, actually. This, this was a side result. We didn't expect it to, to happen. But basically, we can use Phoenix to look at migrations and shutdowns of botnets. If you look at Phoenix data and you plot it uh, time-wise, I don't have really time to dive into this, but if you look at it, it's basically represented in parallel, and you can see the botnet resolution moving from one IP address to the other, from one autonomous system to the other, until the uh, command and control server has been shifted to a different autonomous system. Why? Possibly because the botmaster uh, feared the takedown received a notice from, an, IP, from a, an autonomous system saying, this is malicious activities, we don't want to have you anymore, and we moved this infrastructure to someone who was friendlier. And this is the same thing, but this has been done by defenders, so someone has been basically taking away the infrastructure and putting it on sync called IP addresses. It's the same thing, but instead of being a move, a, a voluntary move by the botmaster is a takedown. And we didn't really realize that Phoenix would be able to show these things. Um, we have several limitations. First limitation, we, are, we have worked on English. It kind of works for most Latin languages as well, provided that you change the dictionary. But for instance, we don't know if it would work for Chinese domains. We don't know if it would work for non-ASCII domains that you can register right now. Um, the uh, second limitation is that if you are looking for early warning for a network, actually an approach with, like the one with NX domains will work faster than this, will be actually faster than this, if you just need to know which machines are infected. If you want to look at the global population and see the botnets acting and moving, then this is better. So it's more of an observation tool and intelligence tool than of an early warning kind of system. Um, I think I have explained very uh, in depth what uh, Phoenix does. Basically, it detects previously unseen automatically generated domains, associates them with botnets, and allow you to track them. Uh, it produces novel knowledge. And uh, among the future work, which is not so much future, uh, we will basically put this online so that you can navigate the data yourself. Uh, so if you want to just uh, uh, follow my Twitter feed, you will for sure find an announcement on that in two, three, four weeks from now, one month tops. So 
this is it. Thank you very much for your attention. I realize that I'm standing between you and lunch, so if you have any questions, I will take them. Uh, if you want, you can also discuss with me on Twitter or via email uh, or just grab me during lunch. Thank you. <laughs>